and welcome to Bad Ideas, the show where we look at misfires, mistakes, and miscalculations from all throughout history. I'm Tony Southcott. And I'm Albert Berg. And today's episode is brought to you by our featured patron, Doc Occupant. That's our friend Dave from over on the Angleland side of the ocean. Thank you, Dave. Yes, the Dave W. Tony's bringing us our bad idea for this week. Tony, what do you got? Today we're going to be talking about the Killdozer. Sounds like a great idea for a B-movie. Yeah, it actually is a B-movie from the 70s. Oh, yeah? But that's not what we're talking about. There is a movie from the 70s entitled Killdozer. And we're not talking about it? No. Like Are you sure? That was just a B-movie. That was not a bad idea. We can't go back to, like, reviewing movies to talk about a movie called Killdozer? I'm sure if you want to resurrect the Human Echoes podcast and bring it back to 251, we could talk about Killdozer. I'm pretty sure it's on YouTube for free right now. Well, what are we talking about then? We are talking about a rampage that happened in Granby, Colorado. Near where you live, I would imagine. It's at least in the same state. Yeah, it's uh, it's probably about hour and a half, hour and 45 from me. Okay. Like, I've been there a few times. Granby's a very non-notable town. It's just another, like, little mountain town. The thing that always stuck out to me is that they had a really cool-looking hot dog stand that was basically shaped like a hot dog. Uh, other than that, Granby is not that notable. It's a town of... I think under 2,000 people, so it's not the not the biggest place out there. Suck it, Granby listeners! <laughs> Our story begins in a muffler shop. As all great stories do. Inside the shop, a man named Marvin Haymeyer weighed his options, feeling desperate and rejected as a cement plant was being constructed right outside his door. The only path to his business was completely blocked by the new factory, and it was one that he had petitioned against several times, and he had... Basically brought this up over and over and over again with the city council, and he was fel- feeling like they just did not care about him at all. He had argued with this commission several times. He even purchased the equipment to build a road around the cement plant to save his business. This included a nearly 98,000-pound Komatsu D355A bulldozer. This guy must be doing really well in his muffler shop if he can afford to buy a bulldozer. Oh, I think he'd just been doing it for a while. Like, he went into his retirement money and things like that to get this from what I was reading. Okay. Even so, apparently not, like, flubbing it up too bad with the muffler business in Granby, Colorado. No, he had, like, a house outside of his his business. He owned the property that the business was on. So it's not like he was completely destitute by any means. Instead of approving this road, they fined him for not being hooked up to a sewage line a sewage line that had been broken by the people of the concrete manufacturing facility a few weeks prior. Man, this is not uh, sounding like a good time for Mr. Muffler. He had no choice but to sell the property. What usually doesn't make it into the story is that the concrete company offered him $250,000 for the land that he had purchased for about $42,000 in 1992. After negotiating the price, he jumped it up to $375,000, And then, just as a giant middle finger to them, he pushed it up to a million dollars, knowing that they would not be able to buy it. The company declined to purchase the two acres uh, for such a price and rezoned their current lot with the city to make it work. So, they needed, or at least he thought they needed this lot to be able to continue. And they were going to try to play ball with them to a certain extent. And then when he just, like got really obstinate about it, they said, well, we'll go a different way then. Yep, that's pretty much how it went down there, and it it just really backfired, because if he would have sold that property, he probably could have bought a pretty nice other shop in town, something that maybe was off of Main Street instead of, like, tucked way behind where this factory was going. Yeah. but Yeah, there's a part of me that I, I know where this story's going, first of all, Uh, if you couldn't tell from the title, uh, I don't want to spoil it, but, uh, there's a part of me that thinks, yeah, I get sort of being upset here and there are probably some injustices being done, but I'm not sure that the best response was just to dig your heels in and not negotiate with anybody. Yeah. And it, it seems like he, he had some options other than just trying to get the city council to do their thing. I understand sometimes it's hard to uproot those, so it's especially if all they needed to do was make a road around the factory, too. Although I think it would have limited his visibility, but I doubt there's very many muffler shops in town, so he was probably the only game in town. But 
At this point, the bitterness still festered. In his journal, he would write, I was always willing to be reasonable until I had to be unreasonable. Sometimes reasonable men must do unreasonable things. You know, again, I, I, I that he could have write that, wrote that in his journal, and that's fine, but also, he wasn't necessarily being reasonable with the concrete company. Probably not. He was being reasonable up to the point where he got what he wanted. But that's not being reasonable. <laughs> While he was sitting in his hot tub, an idea struck him. Thus began the modification of the 53-ton bulldozer into the killdozer. Over the next year and a half, Marvin would slowly weld, tinker, and build this bulldozer into a monstrous bulletproof beast. Inside his garage and with his own hands, he would take tool steel, a high-grade and very tough heavy steel, to make plates to cover the entirety of the tank. Each panel would then have a layer, sometimes over a foot thick, of concrete added in, before having another half-inch thick piece of steel. So he built this thing to be full-on impervious to bullets. And it's... People might not know this, but it's actually relatively difficult to make things what you might call bulletproof. There are some pretty big bullets out there that can go through quite a bit of metal. Yeah, and we're going to be covering some interesting things that he actually did to make this even more bulletproof here in a little bit. Over the next year and a half, Marvin would toil on this project. Numerous times he had friends over, and they hung out in the garage where he was building the killdozer. No one seemed to notice what was going on. Haymeyer would actually attribute this to divine intervention, claiming that God had clouded their judgment and didn't allow them to see the killdozer. From his own tape recordings, which are available on YouTube, he said, God built me for this job. He also said that it was God's plan that he not be married nor have a family so that he could be in a position to carry out such an attack. I think God will bless me to get this machine done, to drive it, to do the stuff I have to do, he said. God bless me in advance for a task that I'm about to undertake. It is my duty... I, God has asked me to do this. It's a cross that I'm going to carry, and I'm carrying it in God's name. An so alternative he, hypothesis might be that he didn't end up getting married because he was the kind of person who would go in his garage and build a killdozer because he was mad at some people who owned a concrete company. Yeah, and there are a lot of women that would like an ingenuitive guy. It's just he focused on the wrong things. Yes, he seems like he's very... Uh, I bet he could get into a real argument with you. Yeah, I bet it would just be a very fun circular argument that never ended, too. What's so strange about this is that people in Granby, where he worked, and Grand Lake, where he lived, said that Marvin was a very affable and likable person, that he seemed rather normal and always got along with the townsfolk, other than, a, than the select few from the zoning commissions and town hall. I only found one instance where he verbally threatened somebody whenever they didn't have the money to pay for their muffler repair, and that ended up getting resolved without having to get cops involved. So if he's a psychopath, he's a low-key psychopath. I don't know if psychopathy really falls into this. I think it was more just slow pressure that caused a psychotic break. Okay. It didn't seem like he was without empathy, and there's reasons uh, for that we'll get into later as well. I, I just, by the way, I just threw that out there. I'm certainly not a psychologist of any kind. I just sort of know where this story is going, and I was throwing a... Like, a bad label that I just sort of pulled out of my hat onto this guy. Don't at me. I get that I'm wrong. These people probably didn't make it onto his hit list. While constructing the Killdozer, Martin put 13 names on a list. People he had been slighted by and the places that he was going to destroy. He planned to expose the town's leaders. On another tape, he said it was to show the town the real mafia-type tactics they were using. That's all there. They're criminals. They bend the law and they got caught and it pissed them off and now they really hate me. In your estimation, after having studied this story, do you think that the town leaders were in fact at least somewhat crooked? I think that they were probably being unreasonable with him a little bit. Like once they got a negative view of him because he was just asking for this and asking for this and asking for this, I think it kind of became something where they're like, yeah, we're never giving this guy anything. Okay. Like, I feel like there was a little bit of bias there. I don't feel like it was straight up like, oh, we're going to screw this guy over. These aren't the county commissioners in Gotham, in other words. Yeah, yeah. It's not It's not like these guys are getting, like, fully paid off. I mean, maybe the cement plant did. I didn't find any sort of evidence of that. Sitting in his garage was the now-complete killdozer. Armored, air-conditioned, and primed for action. 
He set up cameras on the outside of the machine and put them under three inch thick bulletproof glass and set monitors on the inside. He even rigged canned air to a button in the cab to remove dust from these cameras. He also mounted three different guns with ports to the edge of the killdozer. He put a 50 caliber rifle, a 308 semi-automatic rifle, and a 22 caliber rifle out of these ports. Marvin was ready for war. On June 4, 2004, he lowered the armor casing on his bulldozer. There were no doors, no way out. The bulldozer would be his tomb, and with his list, he sought his final retribution. How did the uh, lowering of this work? How does he gets inside of it? This is I know this is not the point of the story, but I'm interested in this. He, he's he knows he's going to be trapping himself. He's got this thing that's going to come down over him. What's the mechanism that he manages to rig up where he can get inside this thing and know he can drive away once it is lowered? He had a small crane in the shop where he was working. He was actually doing this uh, towards the end in that muffler shop, even though he had sold the property. So he had a small crane that allowed him to actually put this in there, and everything just barely fit, which is another thing that he thought meant that he had divine providence and permission to do this because of how everything just kind of worked out inside of this garage. Oh, I thought you meant it just barely fit over the bulldozer, and I was going to say, well, I would imagine he planned it that way. But... No, it, it fit perfectly on the bulldozer. Like, that was definitely something that he planned. Whenever you look at pictures of this, it's... You could definitely tell he's an accomplished welder. It's got a Mad Max sort of feel and look to it because it is just retrofitting a bulldozer. Right. But this is a very, very strong thing. Like, this is not an amateur putting, like, a bunch of armor plates on a car and calling it good. This is a man who is an expert at what he was doing. Yeah, none of what you've said so far has made me feel like this guy was just sort of winging it. He definitely was knowledgeable at the very least. About what he was doing. For better or worse. At around 3 p.m., he burst out of his own garage and took the killdozer to the concrete company that had started all of this. He crushed the buildings and headed toward the town of Granby. And the building that he crushed wasn't actually that small. It was a two-story building, and he just tore, like, the living hell out of this thing. Like, an entire, fit, like, far-facing wall was gone. I think some people might underestimate the total destruction a bulldozer can do to smaller structures. With even a slight head of steam, this will full-on tear through wooden structures with almost no resistance. With brick and cinder blocks, he could slowly and plottingly just go forward and backward or like uh, turn it just a little bit and start knocking the walls and easily knock things down. After crushing the entire wall out of the brick concrete factory, he rolled to the main street of Granby and started thrashing buildings along the way. He sought out the town hall specifically and lay waste to huge portions of the building. Along the way, he shoved cars. Sometimes three would be stacked in front of the killdozer and it wouldn't even slow down. This is where things started getting a little bit more sketchy for him. Like this uh, retribution thing got weird because he was going after a person that was literally a dead man. Two okay. years prior, this man had had passed away, who was part of the zoning commission, and he went to his house and basically bulldozed the house while his wife was inside. Thankfully, the wife was able to get out of the house, but it seems like a petty move to do this after he had passed away. Yeah, it really does. This is, this is what happens, though, when you get bitter at people. Yeah. Well, if this happens every time somebody gets bitter, we are in for a really weird century. Well, I mean, in your heart, this is what happens. You stop making any actual sense. That's very true. You think that you have a, a, a good, you know, a good reason to be angry, but then that good reason just turns completely irrational. The police began to rally and pursue the killdozer. Some of the officers took shots at the armored vehicle, but found that their pistols would do absolutely nothing. Calls for armor-piercing rounds could be heard over the radio, as well as cops calling for evacuations and for SWAT teams. The police department was another target at this point, as he went and crushed cop car after cop car, and then took out a wall before moving on. And whenever I say crushed a cop car, he full-on, like, wrapped these things around themselves. He, this might have been some of the most destruction I saw that was just on a singular object, other than the trees on Main Street that he just plowed over. But he messed up those cop cars. I was going to say, I I imagine a, a small town like Granby probably doesn't have its own SWAT team. Or at least not like 
you know, a fully outfitted unit like you would have in some bigger cities. So these people must be calling for like relatively far outside help, right? Yeah, it's a. I would say to get a SWAT team from Denver would take at least an hour because you got to get the guys rallied and then you got to get them on their like in their vehicle and get them out there. So it wasn't an easy task to get the SWAT team up there, but they did arrive. While rampaging, Haymeyer took shots at propane tanks. Thankfully, none of them exploded because it isn't quite like the movies whenever you shoot a propane tank. It's still very, very dangerous, but it's not going to spontaneously explode like that. Even with all of this destruction, he didn't seem intent on hurting people. Only wanton destruction of property. Ian Doherty, a bakery owner in Granby, said that Haymeyer went out of his way not to hurt anyone. Others think this might have been blind luck. When Haymeyer turned the killdozer on the library, he broke through a wall where only seconds before there had been a class of children present. Thankfully, the cops had actually called the library and were telling them to evacuate whatever it looked like the killdozer was heading in their direction. Well, even if it's luck, it doesn't seem like he's targeting people. Yeah, it's just lucky that he didn't crush a wall and actually hit somebody somewhere. Police, SWAT, sheriffs, and and more followed the killdozer on foot. Under Sheriff Glenn Trainer climbed atop the killdozer and rode it, in his words, like a bronc buster, trying to figure out a way to get a bullet inside the dragon. <laughs> this guy's got a grandiose sense of himself. Yeah, just a little bit. However, he was eventually forced to jump off to avoid being hit with debris. Being that there wasn't a door, there was no uh, way for him to enter. Police also ran up and dropped a flashbang into the exhaust port, which seemed to have very little effect on the killdozer. At this point, the police requisitioned an earth scraper to try and stop the killdozer in one-on-one heavy metal combat, but the lighter vehicle was shoved aside without issue. You could also tell that this cop did not know how to drive the earth scraper very well, because he was just, he was trying to kind of get in the way, and you just watched Haymeyer kind of pause for a minute, and then gun it. Like, he waited for them to get the thing in position, and then just went full throttle, and just shoved it out of the way like it was absolutely nothing. That brings up an interesting question for me. I assume it's not super easy to drive a heavy machinery like this, or at least it's not the same as driving a car around. How much experience did Haymeyer have? Did he spend a lot of time practicing with the killdozer beforehand? I mean, before it was the killdozer? I didn't hear him say like anything in those tapes about practicing with the killdozer. But I know that with the way he drove it, he definitely looked like he was a veteran of it. It wasn't like the first time he just turned it on and went after it. Okay. Well, and he seems like a man who was definitely all about the planning, so... Because he was building the panels away from the killdozer, he probably had more time where he could go out and practice while he was building the thing. It took him 18 months or something like that to actually finish that. So I'm sure he had a little bit of time to go out and drive this thing. Then Governor Bill Owens was watching the situation and realized that they were running out of options. He spoke with the National Guard and began the process of getting an Apache helicopter armed with a Javelin anti-tank missile on the scene. Bill Owens was sort of bailed out at this time because the radiator had actually started to crack. From the helicopter view, you can see a bunch of fluids coming from the engine and kind of streaking down the street. Also, there were giant white plumes rising from this. When you say from the helicopter, do you mean the Apache helicopter that was loaded no, with the javelin was, missile, or is this just a news helicopter? This was a news helicopter, because I, I, there's, there's very little at that point that was happening in Colorado that really deserved more of a news helicopter than this. Bill Owens actually didn't end up having to rally that helicopter and full-on denied that it was happening and said that like he would never even thought of doing that. And then the Sheriff's Department and the National Guard that he was working with were like, yeah, you totally asked us to blow this up. I'm I'm not sure who to trust there. Do you trust the politician or do you trust the army? I would say, I don't think it was a bad call to try to go for an Apache helicopter. I also don't think it's a bad idea to ask what your options are. I don't know why he would deny that he was trying to assess and determine what would work for the situation. Although there were people saying that if he were to fire a javelin missile at this thing, there's a pretty high chance of collateral damage. But at this point, the killdozer is basically just putting out huge puffs of white smoke. And he would turn to a little hardware store called Gambles. Gambles was owned by another one of the Zoning Commission people. And as he started to crush this building, like absolutely tear through maybe 150 feet of wall... He did not know that there was a basement to this building. So 
his killdozer was already hurt, and then all of a sudden it just fell through the floor with one of the treads and got stuck, the engine seized, and the killdozer was dead. Police carefully approached the killdozer. A muffled pop could be heard from the inside of the machine. Police were still wary and tried to use explosives to enter the cab. After multiple attempts with explosives, a slower process with a welding torch was used. After some time, they finally breached the cabin and determined that Haymeyer was dead. Haymeyer had taken his own life with a 357 Magnum. And I assume he probably had this planned out. I mean, yeah. you mentioned he wasn't, he did not have an escape hatch. Yeah, this was uh, this was definitely his last ride. And it's not like he was a young man either. I believe he was 62 at the time of this. So, like, he basically was just done and knew that this was going to be the last thing that he ever did. In the aftermath, the only person who was hurt was Haymeyer. The town was devastated with over $7 million in damage, but thankfully no innocents were injured. In the aftermath, the killdozer was disassembled and scattered to multiple scrapyards so that people wouldn't take trophies of the beast. It's also been very interesting to see that he has become a sort of folk hero. During my research, many people revered what he did. Some used mottos about how he chose liberty or death and how it matters for the American way. I'm not quite going to go that far, but he was a man of singular determination. It's amazing how far he did make it. But yeah, if you go look at the YouTube comments, if you look at the sites that are praising him, there's a lot of those out there. People have kind of turned this into a weird... And I've seen it for both sides. I've seen people say that he was like a libertarian hero. I've seen people say that he was fighting uh, for socialism against consumerism and all sorts of other stuff. It's it's really odd what people have done with his memory. Yeah, I, I, in looking at some photos of this, I came across in my Google image search for the Killdozer. Someone has built a Lego Killdozer, <laughs> uh, I mean, which I, I don't do think that. is an official kit you can get from Lego, but... That tells you a little something about, you know, how people feel about this, maybe? Yeah, if he'd survived, maybe he could have gotten those licensing rights from uh, Lego. I understand where those people are coming from. There is that sense of rage against injustice. Yeah, Where you think everybody has had something bad happen to them and they just couldn't do anything. And you look at this guy and you think, yeah, he got him back. I can see exactly what you're saying. Like it, it makes sense in a in a weird way, but, but it's also just a terrible way to go about getting what you want. Well, yeah, and it's as we mentioned this earlier. I know you're probably going to have other bad ideas uh, to add on to this, but I think just in general, when you let this kind of anger fester in your heart, whether or not it's warranted you just end up hurting yourself. Now, granted, yeah, he hurt other people too, but it's not like the concrete plant went away, right? Like, yeah. those guys are still there. He didn't kill any of the county commissioners. I'm sure... Everybody tax- probably got insurance stuff, and, like, I'm not... Sh- well, I can't say for sure that everybody got insurance stuff and paid for their things. I don't know if the homeowners did or some of the shop owners had insurance. But, like, it's a lot better that it was just that sort of damage. Right, he could have gone on, he could have used this determination to create something to help somebody. Or to start a new business in a new town, or just, instead of letting it fester, he could have done any number of a thousand things that would have been more positive than going and leveling the town that had wronged him. Yeah, that's where I'm at, I guess, with this, is like, is, is what you want to spend your energy on really just getting revenge? Or even getting justice. Like, it did, did were those county commissioners voted out? I, maybe they were. I don't know. I mean, this seems like the type of thing dead. that probably could have gotten a few voted out, but I didn't research that in particular. I'm not trying to put you on the spot. I realize that you haven't. <laughs> no, I. Uh, I just thought that was details. an interesting idea that that might have actually cost them their jobs. I don't think it was worth it for him for the town. I don't think that in the ultimate tally of things that he made the world a better place and the thing is this guy clearly had the know-how and the resources to have done something really remarkably positive too and to have chosen this i think is a little bit disappointing yeah it's like he was a successful business owner and by all accounts he was a a well-liked guy even if he didn't have his family or anything like that like, people people liked spending time with him, and he chose this way out. 
I get like the the bad ideas here are pretty obvious and don't build a giant kill machine that you go and level your town with all that sort of stuff. Mostly it's about what Al was saying where it's like sometimes seeking retribution isn't as good as just moving on and doing the right thing somewhere else. Be the one who's willing to step down sometimes. Yeah. Not all the times, but sometimes. I think that's going to do it for today. Thank you guys so much for listening. If you like this episode, don't forget to tell a friend about it. Uh, and follow us over on Twitter, at Human Echoes. Uh, if you have an idea that you would like us to cover on the Bad Ideas podcast, you can send it into badideasshow at gmail.com or to our aforementioned Twitter account. Thank you guys so much. We will see you next week with something else. Bye. Bye.